And so the consideration is really more to keep their status quo. And and uh, so they're very resistant. And then that can be an energy drain as well because now we're just talking about excuses or in the Bible, you're not supposed to do that or whatever. You know, that kind of goes woo, woo, woo. And, you know, I want to invite the conversation to where we talk about what is this loving conversation into the level and this is a level of esteem and respect for one another, keeping of one's word. There's an integrity aspect. And if something was lost in that dynamic or not fully realized, incomplete, this is where the conversation could potentially become loving enough that it brightens the way. So a person sort of has an instant transformation and goes, I'll never be the way I was in the past again. So when something comes up as a repeated thought pattern in RTP, I can address it better because I catch it and I'm not going to repeat that pattern, let other people down. Um, and that happened at a birthday party. A person was expecting this person had the responsibility to bring the party supplies. The party had begun, was well into an hour, so that person never showed up. Even though they agreed, they had everything ready, they just didn't deliver the goods. We're talking about paper plates and uh and, and plastic forks and nice to eat the cakes and all the goodies that people brought. Uh, maybe the napkins were there too because it was an outdoor party and it was great for our, for our birthday f party for our great friend Tony a year ago. And uh, so, um, yeah, the person never showed up. Somebody else had to go get it and whatever it was, I don't know what it was. I don't want to go into those stories. The loving conversation I want to have is like, well, it's not why you didn't or why you won't sometimes. It's just that never again. <laughs> it's like never again. And it has to be considered on multiple, multiple levels and insights into this is a loving conversation. Because I can be straightforward with somebody and it's not disrespectful. The dis is not what I don't want. And when dis is brought into a situation, so there's disregard, disorientation, right? A, disc, a discombobulation of, of the ideal. So it's a negative spin. Right, going the opposite way of the ideal. And the ideal to me is a functional community conversation that one-on-one -on -one, uh, and uh, on the whole is very inviting and loving. So we can share on this, but we're no longer defending the things that are not serving us, that are simply wrong. There's no excuse for that. That is that. This, which I'm talking about right here, centered, is pristine and it's balanced and it's holistic and it's totally integrated, and it's full of this consideration, but it's the consideration of the possibility, right? And the excuses and the stories of lack and despair are no longer. They, you, someone can make the argue, you know, that they're valid and even give some kind of formulaic validation of it. Yes, we can address social issues, and I do feel they're very important. However, unless there's a centering and a balance point where we can see the ideal and look at things that are not a part of this ideal conversation, we can't put it aside to where we can be properly prepared to address it, then we're stuck with the problem. And I don't want problems, right? I don't mind the challenge. And situations can be addressed in a whole brain, holistic manner. But one must be above the situation rather than being a prisoner of it, right? to be able to see it in its whole capacity. And yes, we can address those issues, but let's be more responsible, one of integrity and being able to keep our word and we're responsible, responsibly handling ourselves in a way that we're supportive of our community objectives and how we can be of service and best help, right? So, this is the invitation, and this is the opportunity of a loving conversation. So one can totally be in the hearing without blame, but yet there has to be something that is addressed in regards to a disappointment or something that wasn't clearly communicated or understood, perhaps, right? That there was a misunderstanding. And so, you know, whatever came up, okay, can it be excused? It's the situation we're talking about. So is what we are in the way that we show up, or when we don't, or other than present, 
Can that be really excused? Now, it could be a matter of training, entrainment. I want to talk about entrainment in another conversation because we've all been conditioned and socialized. So how can we be more aware of our TWA, our thoughts, words, and actions, so that we are flying above in the way that, you know, it's a reflection of our attitude and altitude so that we can address things. If we need to swoop down and address something, we're here and now. And just in a snap of a finger, it might have been addressed. This is transformation. So this is complete change, and we're talking of a conscious nature. So we're no longer relying on the tricks and manipulations of the past that might have informed your identity. This is no longer. And I write a lot about identity, and particularly the cringe factor, which I write, I think I, I need to have a book about. The cringe factor is, I have, a lot of my ideas are embellished from something that I learned from the sociological text. And you can Google uh, um, cringe sociology, you could say, but this is basically in summary, I don't remember the person's name, but someone who um, from Australia, talking about after World War II, who had been a vet, d done their service, went to visit England. You know, and of course they're all part of the, you know, the, uh, the empire, the British Empire at that time, and the Commonwealth. But notice when he was in England, once people found out he was Australian, he wasn't treated quite as well. It wasn't the same as like, oh, well, I thought you were from Manchester. Oh, you're from Australia. Oh, you're an Aussie, eh? Well, you know what I mean? So we can have some fun with it. But the idea was that they, he, he saw himself that he wasn't an equal citizen on the status, even though he had fought in the war and he thought that would have meant something. And, you know, um, it didn't seem to make a difference. He was an Aussie and it wasn't quite the same. Anyway, so that was a cringe factor he noticed that, that, that I guess people could be on both sides. I don't know actually where the cringe part comes in, but it was the cringe like, oh, you're Australian, right? Yeah. But I took this apart like I do for many words that I've created as an acronym, or acronym, so that each letter represents a word and, and the cringe is there, but it represents identity in the way that um, I write about in the MORB theory. So MORB, M-O-R-B, dot masstrance, dot com. Yes, the hypnosis of society particularly with, with identity. So really quick here, and I'm going to end this talk, but the cringe, just like how it's spelled C-R-I-N-G-E, it begins with class, right? It's like well, the identity of what class you're in, and people are affected by class, race, right? And whether you look, you look at this from the I, income, but also look at, if you want to put an A there, it would be or your, it could be an age status, but it is the amount of some number there. And... Um, nationality, gender, and then ethnicity. Each of those words, C-R-I-N-G-E, class, race, income, nationality, gender, and ethnicity is the cringe. Because if we just relate to other people based on their portfolio of those things, then you're already made up or you're talking to that image or that portfolio but not the person, or at least the you know, it's the, the the real true identity of the person is kind of shielded off based on that's how we see and perceive people. So I'm not really for that, and I know there's positioning on, let's say, both sides of the debate in America, if you're left or right, and the polarization and cancel culture and all these other things that are going on, this represents sort of a uh, an evolution of consciousness in our society and community that if we're able to sort of transcend these things that are projections, really, and I call them illusions because we allude to them, and every time we're alluding to something, it's perceived out there, it's mentally manufactured in the mind. So the illusion is not real, but you talk to it as if it is. So then we kind of reinforce things that are really not serving us, and in this regard, it can really uh, be counter to the revolution that we want to create in consciousness. So we need to really sort of step up our game. And the awakening process is a movement I call self-liberation. Self-liberation means getting out of our stories, things that are no longer serving us. And my dream is to create a real movement that we can have community conversations, loving conversations about these things. What is the mass trance? And what is morbidity when we project artificial identity onto screens that now are going to treat you in the association of how I'm affiliated with the cringe in regards to these different things that are programmed and socialized. This is the mass trance. So to awaken out of it, you know, you want to be elegant in the dynamic of how you are in relationship with people. Otherwise, it could be very upsetting. Now, some people say, hey, we got to shake up the status quo. 
I'm just saying, hey, you know, why don't we just come to a realization of things and make it elegant in the way that we perform in the way of just simply showing up and being present, that we model this excellence and simply this way of being present, that this awakening naturally occurs because we're a channel for it. We're allowing for this. And so yes, some things need to be addressed. And the loving conversation in this regard is to be polite as you can. You don't lose the idea of respect, even though you could be very disappointed. And there could be things that brought up and you want to point the finger because you've been hurt. And it's totally understandable, right? There's feelings there. It could be anger and disregard and all kinds of things. And yet you hold to the position that, yes, you want to be heard, but the hearing and the listening really is something deeper to say, hey, this is what I stand for. So your regard to this is a reflection of the here and now. And if word is not honored, and if a situation is allowed to sort of, you know, not handled responsibly, and a situation is sort of becomes a situation, well, that wasn't necessary. And someone could have a very detached view of it and go, oh, blow it off. But yet they could be totally responsible to the impacts and the effect on the environment, people involved, a situation that was left unresolved were unattended to, disregarded, not honored. Yes? So, in concluding, creating the metasphere, the atmosphere for loving conversation can be challenging at times, and there's no question about it. And there are some people, maybe rightly so, that are devils. <laughs> and there's just no way in your space, in your time, in your framing of things, that it's possible for you. And this is I would say, in certain regards, man, you know, a lot of things have happened to some people, by other people, that it can be very challenging to have a loving conversation. So I think there has to be a quality standard, and the engagement has to be balanced from all sides, who are participants in this, to have an understanding of what a loving conversation is, and to recognize whether it's possible or not. And if there is interest and there's an attempt to be made, it could be something that we evolve, it has to grow, or drill down into it and allowed to sort of uh, have the experience that might not always be complete in the way that is going to uh, be enjoyable or serving everyone's interest at that particular moment in time. However, to have a conversation on some level so there's clarity, there's communication, uh, is good because I think rather than, than allowing things to fester or if some person's not satisfied, and if you're talking about customer service, and it doesn't always have to be a business transaction because it certainly can be in regards to if there was any sort of transaction or promise made or obligation and there was less than the ideal delivery, at least to the communication of what the understanding was, well, then there's something to be talked about as far as the deliverables and how you or that object or that situation manifested how things showed up or not is an important loving conversation to have. And certainly who and what is on display, what I'm talking about is who is present in the conversation is a reflection of this ideal to how serious a person really wants to have a loving conversation. At the same time, issues need to be addressed. So the balancing of these things and the framework and how we can address them are keys to explore further through experimentation and practice, a practice of being present. And this is self-liberation. Communityconversations.com, selflib.org, and lovingconversations.com. I'm Mike Ratner. Thank you. MikeRatner.com. Check out the podcast channel.